from Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant James Mansfield. Welcome to the big picture. Today, we bring you another program in our series devoted to America's combat infantryman the soldier who wears the blue badge, a badge of merit. This time, we have the history of a great old unit, the Red Bull, the 34th Infantry Division. Later on, Colonel Quinn will tell you a lot of interesting facts about your nation's highest military awards, most of which are won by combat infantrymen, the men who wear the blue badge. To tell you more about our story, we take you to the office of Colonel William W. Quinn. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? Today we honor the 34th, or Red Bull Division. During the last war, it was made up from a National Guard unit, made up from the states of Minnesota, North and South Dakotas, and Iowa. Later on, we're going to discuss the family of American medals for heroism, but now, the Blue Badge presents the 34th Infantry Division. Pretty big place, America. With 48 states like part of a growing family. Same blood, but with different interests. Out of the different interests, the pastures and villages and farms, cities and towns, we came. National Guardsmen from North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Minnesota, to form the core of the 34th Infantry Division under the leadership of Major General Walsh. It was not the first time. When Abraham Lincoln called for volunteers in 1860, the first Minnesota Volunteers, forerunners of the 135th Infantry Regiment, contributed heavily to Northern strength during the Civil War. And again in 1918, men from these states volunteered to fight for America, formed the 34th Division, excelled on the field of battle. But the hard-won victory did not bring lasting peace. A power-hungry maniac named Hitler stirred a frenzied people to aggression. Once again, men from the Midwestern states left their homes for the training camps. Long hours, long days, tired feet, aching backs, turned peaceful civilians into hardened soldiers. Almost before we knew it, we were on our way. A trip to parts unknown. There was no turning back now. And then we were in Belfast, Irish band and all, the first American troops to reach foreign soil, Major General Hartle commanding. More training days lay ahead, even more rugged than in the States. We did so well that 80% of the crack first rangers were Red Bull men. Then training came to an end. We were on our way. We were in our starting blocks waiting for the gun to go off. Every man had his own way of passing time. We knew something big was underway. We found out what it was. Operation Torch, November 1942. That meant landing on three separate beaches, Casablanca, Oran, and Algiers. 
The 168th RCT had the job. They helped establish bases for a final assault on Tunis. We climbed down into the landing craft, shoved off for our first beach. We were covered by big guns. It felt good to see those heavy shells going out. Big guns are a help, but the actual fighting and mopping up was left to us. The first battle was won. Time out for cheers and parades. A brief time out. There still was a lot of ground to cover. A long, rough road lay ahead. Many battles to be fought. A few to be lost, others to be won. We were moving up now to the key defense in the Battle of Tunis, the tankers running interference for us. But the Nazis rushed through Faid, pushed their way back to Kasserine Pass, with armored columns advancing in a three-pronged assault. We lost 2,500 of our buddies. Rummel, the old desert fox, was in the driver's seat at Kasserine. German air power ruled the skies. Then, on the verge of defeat, we dug in with the French and British and drove them back. Then we moved forward again. But there still was some of the bloodiest fighting of the Tunisian campaign left. A pile of twisted rock known as Hill 609. The enemy had height, observation, fortified positions, and good fields of fire. It was rough, and we paid in blood for every inch of ground. But we won that battle too, the toughest in the Tunisian campaign, and on May 1st, we held the summit of Hill 609. The 34th had come into its own as a cool, skilled fighting machine. We kept after the Germans, always moving up, pushing them back. Rut and pomp of Hitler's crack troops shriveled inside their battered uniforms. The peace-loving American had become a superior soldier. Now he was receiving a conqueror's tribute. In no time, the party was over. We were on our way to the Italian front, Salerno in support of the 36th Texas National Guard Division. That was a tough beach. The Germans held the hills and held Americans in their gun sights. Attack and counterattack, the beach had almost lost, regained. The craft was very heavy. Our artillery was a prime target. Only our allied anti-aircraft kept them off, made them pay. We began landing in Italy on D plus 12 to drive on Avellino, under command of Major General Ryder for a continued attack on Benevento. The 34th was fully committed to the long, arduous, bitter Italian campaign. First, the push across the Volturno River, 
three desperate crossings, battling the elements in addition to mines, rifles, machine guns, mortar, artillery. Names that will never be forgotten. Dragoni, Ruviano, and a half dozen other small towns too hard to pronounce. The guy who said there was no glory in the infantry said it all. There wasn't time for glory. We were on the move again. Mud, mules, mountains. And General Eisenhower, General Clark, and General Smith didn't sidestep the mud either. That meant new plans in the making. The 34th had fought its way to the German winter line. The 34th led the attempt to break the German winter line, with the commanding general laying plans for an all-out assault. Mount Pantano was the key German anchor. Once this hill was taken, other key points could be approached. Mount Pantano was first attacked on the 29th of November by the 1st Battalion, 168th Infantry. By December 4, when the 135th Infantry relieved the 168th, 777 casualties comprised the human cost for a mile's advance. With Pantano out of the way, the 5th Army moved on. Mount Lungo, San Pietro, Mount Samuro fell. The 34th took San Vittore, Mount La Chiara, Cervaro, Mount Trocchio. The winter line was completely smashed. This feat, accomplished in foul winter weather against a series of mountain entrenched positions, outstanding in the history of American arms. But there's always another hill. This time, Casino. If Casino falls, the march to Rome is assured. But Casino did not fall. The 34th's battle for Casino lasted until the 14th of February with little change in position. Each day and night saw bitter engagements fought, desperate attempts by enemy and ally to gain or regain position. Our men did heroic deeds under terrific odds. Beset by winter weather, superior observation, mountain defenses, the 5th Army failed to take Casino. We were on the defensive. Finally, bombing of the monastery was ordered. It crumbled as we left the valley for a rest. Meanwhile, the 6th Corps opened up the Anzio beachhead, a flanking maneuver. On the 27th of March, the 34th relieved the 3rd Division on the Anzio beachhead. D plus 64. Broken in replacements on the line dug in, waiting for the breakthrough. It came the 23rd of May at 2.15 a.m. Complete surprise had been achieved. The 135th Infantry was part of Task Force A under Major General Harmon. All the first day objectives were taken. On we went. The medics kept pace, saving lives, softening pain wherever possible. German resistance at La Nubio finally broke about the 1st of June and we were off on a mad dash to Rome. Some of us stayed long enough to get the cheers.
But for most, we moved across the city's flank and without halting, speeding up the west coast, capturing the great port of Kibitavecchia, moved quickly northward to the Tarquinia area, there enjoying an all too short rest. Then northward once more. Now, for the first time in Italy, we had a real rest. Hot showers, clean clothes. General Clark presented the presidential citation to the 100th Battalion, the famous Nisi outfit. You are always willing to close with the enemy. He has no bluff on you, and you've always defeated him. And let me tell you again, the 34th Division is proud of you. The 5th Army is proud of you. America is proud of you. And I know that whatever future action you go into, you will conduct yourselves with glory and bring about the peace that we are entitled to. Good luck to you, and God bless you. But wars do not wait on honors. The enemy still held north of the Arno. They had dug in as they had dug in at the Winter Line north of Naples and at the Gustai Line, at Casino. Now the Gothic Line barred the way through the Apennines. The Po Valley was as heavily and effectively guarded as was the Leary. Once again, winter weather, fatigue, casualties, supply joined the German defenses. The attack ground to a halt. A long winter holding action followed. Numerous attack plans were made, but execution was delayed due to the miserable weather and resulting road conditions. During the winter of 1944-45, General Truscott took command of the 5th Army. In the spring, the 34th was relieved for a short rest before sparking the next all-out assault. General Charles Bolte took this opportunity to decorate many officers and men for jobs well done. The 34th did well in the matter of decorations. 14 medals of honor out of 201 presented to all services went to heroic members of the Red Bull Division. Also numerous DSCs and Silver Stars. April came. So did the all-out assault on the last mountain line in Italy. The 168th led off. It took four bitter days to break the enemy entrenched on Mount Belmonte, the Sebizano Ridge, Gorgogano Church. On the night of April 17th, the 1st Battalion, guided by recently captured PWs, skirted the left flank of the 2nd Battalion, followed a stream through extensive minefields, captured hundreds of the enemy, and by morning had penetrated the full depth of the German position. During the night of April 20th, the 133rd mounted tanks entered Bologna. The 34th was in the Po Valley. And then the 34th shifted into high gear, turned northwest, cut through the supply lines of an entire German army attacking north, took Modena, Reggio, Parma, Piacenza, held a thin 80-mile front across the retreat route of no less than three relatively intact enemy divisions. This was one of the boldest maneuvers in the entire campaign. Not satisfied with this masterly action, we doubled back, breaking contact with the enemy, moved 150 miles in slightly over 24 hours. Into years of desperate effort came when the 34th German Division surrendered intact to the 34th American Division. Victory in Italy followed on May 2nd, while German troops and civilian supporters trooped into concentration areas in vehicle or on foot. Exhausted 34th men slept. For them, the war in Italy was over. Now, once more, 34 is the symbol of peace. Secured by a new Red Bull Division, National Guardsmen from Iowa and Nebraska. Mission, 
to carry on a peacetime service to the people. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at the United States Family of Medals for Heroism. The first of these is the Bronze Star Medal. This medal was created in 1944. However, it was made retroactive to Pearl Harbor to take care of those actions uh, and those performances involving bravery that took place that day and from 41 to 1944. This medal is given for acts of heroism against the enemy and involves or entails one spontaneous or calculated act. This medal is also given for meritorious service. But a V on the ribbon, a V for valor or for victory, denotes that the medal was given for heroism and not for meritorious service. The next medal is the Silver Star. This medal was created in 1918 and is given to the man who distinguishes himself in gallantry and action based on a demonstration of valor, bravery, or heroism much greater than the Bronze Star Medal, but again less than the Distinguished Service Cross. The Distinguished Service Cross was created in 1918 and is given for extraordinary and outstanding acts of heroism and courage and in order to get this particular medal, an individual must have risked his life. This is the nation's second highest award, and it is a wonderful award, but it is not as great as the Medal of Honor. The Congressional Medal of Honor is the Medal of Medals. It is truly the greatest award in the world. It parallels the famous English Victoria Cross and is given to individuals who display acts of heroism, bravery, all forms of heroism in the face of the enemy, and those far beyond the call of duty. I think it might be interesting to tell you a little something about this medal. It became apparent during the war between the states that some form of medal should be given for extraordinary heroism. Therefore, the Congress, by resolution in 1862, and approved by the President, President Lincoln at the time, adopted this medal. It was made retroactive for activities of certain forms of combat during the Civil War and during the I certain Indian Wars. But so many of, of these medals were given away during the Civil War that in 1918, the statute was re revised, making the winner of this award making him do greater and more outstanding feats of heroism. And from that time on, 1918 until the present day, the standards for the Congressional Medal of Honor have been maintained at very, very high standards. Another element of historical interest surrounding the medal involves the first soldier to be its recipient during the Civil War, one Private Francis Brownell. It seems that on 24th of May, 1861, a Colonel E.E. E. Ellsworth of the 11th New York Infantry from the opposite side of the Potomac noticed a Confederate flag flying from the top of a hotel, the old Marshall House in Alexandria. He enlisted the services of Private Brownell, crossed the river, and the two of them entered the hotel, went to the top of the hotel, and took down the Confederate flag. On his way down from the top of the hotel, coming down the staircase, he encountered a rebel with a gun in his hand who promptly attempted to take the colonel's life. Private Brownell stepped in and attempted to preclude the man from shooting the colonel. However, he was unsuccessful. The man shot the colonel and of course he died later on. In the fight that ensued, Brownell killed the rebel and for the action in attempting to save the colonel's life by risking his own was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. 
In regard to the medal, I have some interesting statistics about the rifleman and his connection with the Congressional Medal of Honor. In World War I, there were 95 Congressional Medals of Honor given away. Of these, 83 were earned by infantrymen. In World War II, a total of 292. Over three-fourths of these went to the infantry. In Korea, all services, up to June of 1952, there were a total of 71. The Army received 48, the Marines 20, the Navy 2, and the Air Force 1. Of the 71 medals, a total of 62 went to the man with the rifle. In summation, here are some of the more famous winners, some of the more famous wearers of the Medal of Honor. Sergeant Alvin York, World War I. Commando Kelly, Italy, World War II. General MacArthur in Bataan. General Wen Wainwright in Corregidor. Lieutenant Audie Murphy in France in World War II. And in Korea, Captain Ray Harvey. This brings to a close our program for today. But please look in again when we bring you the 82nd Airborne Division and an interview with a famous paratrooper. So until next week, this is Colonel Quinn speaking for the combat infantrymen who ask you to look twice at the man with the blue badge, for it's the mark of a man. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.